Now the 2015 seminar, which will be held uh, again in July, the July 22nd, and at this venue uh, from 9.45, that's a Wednesday, and that topic will be the power of ageing, and that's being run by the South West region this year under the direction of Paul Tyson. It's just one of the many hats that Paul seems to wear uh, from time to time and all the time. Now, looking further ahead, 2016, as you may know, is our 30th anniversary. I feel we need to celebrate this milestone. Certainly a publication of some kind along the lines of the 10 and 20 year booklets, maybe a conference or even a big party. <laughs> now, <laughs> okay, so to make that happen, uh, we need an anniversary committee from one or more of the regions and that will need to be got together pretty soon. Then the breed of Peter should be our presence the next year. Yeah. There are so many people who uh, are deserving, and therefore, I'm not sure what the criteria is. But, um, <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. And you notice how he emphasized very few loops. <laughs> but it's absolutely uh, wonderful to be here on a Sunday and see so many people. Here. Um, let me just start off by acknowledging uh, the Wajaknuna people that and we meet on their lands. But also, I want to do a special acknowledgement. My grandmother's 101st birthday is today. It's wonderful that she was active not in uh, U3A, but something very similar. But at 101, she's now a participant rather than an organizer. Uh, it's still going strong. So, um, indeed, the University of Western Australia is absolutely thrilled and delighted for its long partnership with uh, U3A and looks forward to continuing that for the next 30 years as well. So, congratulations on 30 years. Uh, we've actually elevated the relationship, so uh, with Extension moving into the University Club, we've elevated the relationship with U3A, so it sits, um, indeed, with the Central University and myself as the Deputy Vice Chancellor. Um, we hope that uh, ensures a little bit more stability in, in ongoingness. Um, and then I brought the letter just to confirm the, the conditions we're under right now. But I'll give that to Peter um, as I step down. <coughs> With that, just let me congratulate all of you for 30 years. It doesn't happen in these organizations with all, all the effort that you've given. And from the university's perspective, we couldn't be prouder to have the association uh, that we have for those 30 years. So thank you very, very much. I'd like, first of all, just a couple of perspectives. And one of them is, why do electors vote the way they do? 
What is it that determines who is going to win and who is going to lose? To show you how old I am, I first remember vividly reading about the result of the 1945 election in the United Kingdom, in which Winston Churchill, who obviously to anybody, including me at the time, was one of the extraordinary heroes of all time, led his Conservative Party to election in July 1945, and his party was absolutely annihilated. The Labour Party had the second biggest win in its entire history, only exceeded by one of Tony Blair's. And I asked the question then of my father, he wasn't particularly good at answering it, how in the heck could the people reject a wartime leader? I then happened to watch a series called Upstairs, Downstairs. <laughs> in the 1926, there was a general strike. And when that general strike took place, the people working in the kitchen, in upstairs, downstairs, were divided as to whether they should support those upstairs who were looking after them or whether they should support their fellow workers in the strike outside. The enemy of the working class was Winston Churchill. He was seen as the number one conservative who was determined to grind the working class into the ground. And when 1945 came, the people did not vote thank you for the war. They voted, we want a new and better world and not one that you should leave. In fact, of course, within six years he came back as Prime Minister and they pretty quickly found the new world there as it was, was no more marvellous than what they were hoping. And of course, the Depression and the war, they thought there were problems to go away and they didn't. And in 1933, let me use the homegrown example, Western Australians went to the polls. They went to vote for a government led by Sir James Mitchell, opposed by a Labour Party led by Phil Collier. Colin, by the way, was subject to my honours thesis at the University of Western Australia. And on the same day, they had to part, vote in the referendum. Should Western Australia leave the Commonwealth of Australia? <laughs> on that day, 66% of the electors said we should leave the Commonwealth. 33 plus percent said we shouldn't. It's an issue which keeps coming back from time to time. It's actually been <laughs> On the same day, the Conservative Party, or Liberals, or Nationalists, whatever they called it at the time, led by Sir James Mitchell, were utterly annihilated. And Sir James Mitchell lost his own seat in Parliament. Fortunately for him, the new Premier, Phil Collier, liked him and appointed the Lieutenant Governor of Western Australia, so it wouldn't be broke. <laughs> so they voted out of office the, the government led by Mitchell, which strongly supported secession, and voted into office the Labour Party led by Collier that was completely opposed to secession and had no intention whatever of trying to carry out. The Collier government sent delegates to England, but none of their own members went on the delegate, and the English told you you can't, and the West Australian delegates came home and realised they couldn't. Now, how could the electorate possibly, on the same day, mm -hmm. annihilate the party that wants secession and yet vote for it? And the answer is they wanted to kick every government in the teeth at the same time. <laughs> they did not care at all about the, the, the complications of what they were doing. And so if electors don't like you, you're going to get thrown out. And in the last recent federal election, now I don't think it's too unfair to say that the electors didn't vote Tony Abbott in. They determined they voted the previous government out mm -hmm. because they decided it was a shambles. There was a lot of accusations made that, that, that it didn't have a proper majority. It was a minority government. Well, let me tell you that between 1941 and 1943, John Curtin was Prime Minister of Australia with a minority government. He had a majority in neither House, neither in the House of Representatives nor in the Senate. And this was in the midst of our worst war ever. And so this hung Parliament between 41 and 43. Did it do the job well or did it not? Curtin had won by 600 votes in his previous election in 1940. In 1943, he won by 23,000 votes. <laughs> I, went, I was at his funeral on someone's shoulders because I couldn't see what was happening at the time and there were 20,000 people there. So a hung parliament can function perfectly effectively in the right circumstances. But anyway, this is the point of the story. He is, is that the, uh, the electors operate very much, first and foremost, frequently, on voting that government out. There are exceptions. One exception was 1972. It's certainly true they voted the Liberals out because they've been there for 23 years. 
But it's also true that they voted Gough Whitlam in. Mean. And if you want well, someday you get the chance if you see some of those programs on the ABC and others about Whitlam's policy speech at that time. And I never can recall such a range of issues at the same time. Mm -hmm. The ending of editing of the conscription, bringing home the Vietnam conscripts, the free tertiary education, uh, equal pay for women, you name it. One thing after another. It, that was an election where he was voted in. Now, certainly once he got in, all sorts of problems developed and he was enthusiastically voted out. But there's a rare occasion, and I have to say, notwithstanding all the criticism, that Brian Burke was voted in as much as the others were voted out. It wasn't that they, they rejected to what Sir Charles Court had been doing, although admittedly he left by that time. But also because Brian Burke promised a different Labour Party and in the short term they got one. <laughs> and uh, if, if I can make a, what I consider an impartial comment, or whatever else the, the Burke government successes did do, they did do very well with Rutgers. And uh, as, as, as a person who, who, who lives in Leaderville, and, and who each year goes to a special reunion of, of my fellow students, uh, for, uh, we were students together in, in Mandurah. I think the, the railway line here is absolutely magnificent. It runs precisely on time. Why are you not there at the period? And um, let me just mention one other couple of other political perspectives before we get on to the real issue, which is about people like us. But um, <clears throat> one, of, one of the points I wanted to make is that it used to be the case that the Labour Party didn't do very well in state elections, but did very well, sorry, in, in federal elections, but did very well in state elections. And in Western Australia, for example, we, we had a Labour government in Western Australia between 1924 and 1947, uh, except for three years. And the, 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 the three year period ended rapidly with that secession vote. So at that stage, the, the Labour did not often win in the federal election. As soon as they did, there was a problem. They won, and then there was conscription. They won again and there was a depression. And then, and then they won again, they won again after, after the Second World War. And they thought they knew where they were, they had the communist issue and they were all sorts of stuff. And uh, Ben Ben Shifley was voted out, I might add, as much as anything else for a policy which at the time I thought vaguely made sense, and now I think it doesn't make any sense at all. And that was a question of nationalising the banks, making all of the only bank in Australia a government bank. And while that might have seemed rather bad up here at the time, who knows? And so, there's just a couple of things, thoughts about politics here before I get on to the agent, but even before I get to there, could I give you an incident my wife brought to my attention of how times have changed? <clears throat> we have started, we've led the recent times, hey, having got sick of free, free to read television and advertisements, we started buying um, DVDs and we watched various programs. And we dug up a program about a man called Colombo. <laughs> but Colombo was a detective, sort of, always dressed in extremely sloppy fashion, always wandering in and out of places and so on, and always, just as he got to leave, oh, another thing. <laughs> and I informed his biography, it's actually called, and another thing. But the point that came up with my wife last night, that really came home to me, I said, look, Colombo is constantly going into buildings and houses which he doesn't own. And somehow he gets into them, and then someone rings him there. How can they go to ring him there? <laughs> and my wife said, that's a contrivance of the writers. The difference is that detective programs made more recently, that is not an issue. The, the issue is quite simple. This, this little gadget I have is the one that's primitive that there is at least. That's what they're about. But when I watch Inspector Lindley, who I've watched every single episode of him probably twice, Inspector Lindley has always been confident in that it's no more fun. And that's just a small illustration of the whole way that I think Clubbo smokes all the time. Mm. Now, <laughs> just it would not be allowed or something. Anyway, let's move on to what the, the main part, or second part of what I want to say, and I'll keep it on all the time, the politics of ageing. <clears throat> and I'd like to make the point that, 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 that in, 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 in my opinion, ageing is, is, is extraordinary how important it has now become, and it is important that we try to step it in perspective. And I go back, first of all, to that comment about 1860, that in 1860, there was barely 1% of the population aged over 60. All right. Now, there's a general proposition about dealing with the aged. In 1911 or thereabouts, the British government decided 
to introduce a system known as national insurance. And this was a very, it was a liberal government, but the liberals weren't were the liberals, there was also conservatives. And this liberal government decided that it would have social insurance, national insurance, that every British taxpayer would contribute to a fund which in due course would be used to fund the fair retirement. And that was the dream of 1911. The Australians ignored that, as we'll see in a moment. They didn't even attempt to try that. In late in the 1930s, they talked about it briefly. And when I was teaching about this at, at the Curtin University, I discovered that national insurance doesn't work. You cannot get people in 1911 to pay into a fund for their pensions and use the money that they have paid to live on in 1940 or 50. Because by that time you get there, that money is not worth almost the payment you mm -hmm. How are they going to be cared for in 1945-50 by the next generation? Mm -hmm. And so developed what is the fundamental, the contract of the generations. Each generation, <clears throat> until now, has lived on the assumption that when the time comes, and they need now, the taxpayers of them will find the money the way they, as taxpayers, found the money for those in their own year. And the problem of the politics of AD and A is that this, this financial scenario is coming up against hard demographic problem. That people are just progressively getting older. And it's not only that people are getting older, but it's also that there are fewer replacements at the other end. Australia doesn't do too badly in that respect. Australia, in terms of having people having children and so on, doesn't do too badly, but it barely meets what might be called the, the, the replacement quota, which is you need each couple to produce a bit more than two children to allow for, for those who don't. And the, the, the problem is in Australia is that the birth rate has fallen has been slowly and consistently falling. Not as dramatically as some places. The classic case where it's a huge problem is Japan. And Japan is the standard. Because in Japan, the birth rate has plunged to a great level and they don't have the other factor which Australia has, which is crucial, and that's immigration. However much immigration may upset some people, however much there might be controversial issues, but immigration has helped to stave off what, what could be much worse? Because immigrants, you know, they normally come, I mean, they, some of their older relatives come, but a considerable number of them come and attempt to make a new life in which they're making contributions that go along the way. So the, 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 the fundamental problem is that not only is the community ageing, but also that the replacement at the other end is less. Australia has it less than a number of countries but it still has the problem. And the way that politics is to be conducted in the future is to how do we deal with the problem of the age? But if it was simply a case of a whole smattering of people that we call aged people and all the others, but it's not just that. I talked to my son-in-law about this yesterday. He's, he's an economist who thinks very hard about these things. He said the trouble is that the aged community now makes up is made up of quite distinct groups. You've got Group A, which is completely dependent on the pension. As far as Group A is concerned, the electoral issues are what the pension is. <clears throat> How much is it? And, it, and their wish is it will be linked to real wages, not to the cost of living. They want the wage for uh, the, the age of pension to move as the community moves, not simply by how much it costs. The governments, of course, from time to time, come up with the idea of the <coughs> that But they're only one group. There are all sorts of other groups. There are groups who have made some provision for their retirement, but, but who also are drawing on the pension in part. Their concerns are with the degree to which their other income is kept away from, from taxation and doesn't get in the way of their pension. How much superannuation income can you have before you can also have a pension to supplement it? So you've got this particular group who are in another category. 
And then you have a group that they start to hear about now. I didn't know there were that many around, but I've heard more about them recently. The people who are drawing some sort of pension, but who own not only their own home, but have more than more than one million dollars in, in accounts as well. And the government is now coming up to the question of what do we do about that? <clears throat> and then, of course, there, there, there are those who, relatively few, who simply can ignore the whole system completely. The age population consists of all these different groups. Where, which way does the government turn? Which is the primary direction to use? One of the obvious factors, of course, is the age for receiving things has to go up. 65, everything is going to move up. It has to move up. But the point is, which groups do you deal with and which groups do you try to handle in, in, in which way? And that's the kind of scenario we, which is faced in politics now. It was a very simple issue once that you could say that older people vote more conservatively than younger people. <coughs> that, you know, in, when, certainly, when I was teaching at university in 1968, a huge part of the support for the upcoming Whitlam government <coughs> came, of course, from younger people. They, they were a huge, huge part of the support, and the opposition to them came from older people. But that's not true now in 2015. <coughs> the Labour Party is no longer seen as the repository of the party for, 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 for younger people. It's, it's, it's a much more complex situation now. For example, uh, I'm, I'm told that there are some very strong and enthusiastic younger people who are liberal parties, and in particular, some of those who, who go to what we might call the more conservative churches. And they, they provide a very important you know, workforce now on you know, election day. So that the, com the composition of it is not a simple fact that if you're old, you know, you're more likely to vote conservative than if you're young, you're more likely to be young. It's where you are in the system. Where are you? Are, are you a person who's dependent on the pension by itself? Are you a person who's, who's dependent on, on the degree of the pension? Are you a person who's not going to be dependent at all? Do you have substantial assets? Don't you have substantial assets? And the government has to come up with packages to try and balance all of these out. And the voting power of each group is, it is, it is very hard to predict. I'd like to make the point that in Australia, the first major decision that we made were in the 1890s and the first part of the, of the 20th century. But that's when we introduced the age pension at all. And the age pension came in with a means test, which is quite different. From, 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 from the British approach. And <clears throat> that, that, that was the way, that was the way we, we, we started. And then aged people did not really become a big focus of interest. In fact, the real interest in the 1920s and 30s was not, not with the plight of the age, but the fact we said we didn't have enough people, not enough children were being born, and not enough migrants were coming. Then, as the age situation started to bite in late 1945 and 1950, it all eased off for a bit because, of, first of all, the, the post-war boom in babies and the migration, but then it began to cut down the bounce again. And the Age Persons Home Debt was an important step forward by Menzies in the 1950s. Now, I, I would say that from 1980 onwards, the politics of the age and politics of ageing has become the major central financial issue which government has to deal with. And it's got all sorts of factors. It's not only the factors of all the different kinds of aged people, it's also the question of the birth rate with children, it's also the question of immigration, and the points of how these can balance. And how elections come out about all of that, it would take someone who's spent as much time as I have trying to guess, and I really don't know. And all I can say in conclusion, perhaps on this whole thing, is that in the end, so much now depends on what you see from television, speeches you hear, comments which you make. And one quick point about that, if a politician makes a brilliant speech the day before the election, one of the problems is already about 20% of people have voted because we can't vote in this world most. So can I say we're in a new and complex world Anyone who can confidently say what's going to happen, I've no idea. But the one thing we can confidently say <laughs> is that people like us really do matter because we are going to be the backbone of all the problems that Do you see any hope that there is in, um, say, the political courses being run at the university? 
that um, there's any chance that we might get the statesman we all looking for? <laughs> when I was at Curtin University for quite a long time, I taught Australian history and politics. Currently, they have one person teaching Australian history, and they teach no Australian politics at all. Mm. They teach the politics of terrorism mm. and those kind because they are in issues, but they don't teach Australian politics at all. So anyone who does journalism at Curtin does not get access to issues, on, whereas every journalism student there was, with all the main thing you do and, and everything. I don't think that universities are increasingly places which teach people that their real basis of funds and what they're fighting for are major research grants. Mm -hmm. and, and they're all aspiring for a high place in the Australian and it's a, a, a sort of table of these things. So I may be seen as someone from the past, but I, mean, I, I have a, a friend of mine who, who's a professor and I think a very good professor, a very good teacher, but that person's contract it depends on getting money from outside organisations for work she's doing. The teaching of students is they do, but it's not the real basis of where the, where, where the real hunt for wealth is coming. And it's not the real basis why they're supporting strongly decentralising, you know, and, and, and making the university able to charge what they want. Because they want to attract people who will get world grants and things of this kind and will bring in research monies. So I wouldn't hold out too much hope for the universities. <laughs> and I don't know how much hope I can hold out from the press even. So I'm quite sure. Where we go, we accept that somehow we manage to survive. When I glance around this room, I don't see anybody in this room at the moment that I can readily identify as Muslim. The projections of population are that by, is it 2050 or 2070, is the, the inhabitants of the earth will be predominantly Muslim, not Christian. Uh, I wonder in what ways that trend, that demographic, demographic shift, will affect the issues in particular of taxation, politics, and election. Thank you. Mm. It's, a, it's a very, it's, it's a very complex issue, which is a good way of saying I can't answer it. And <laughs> I would like to, use the, like to use the technique that I used to, that I learned from Bob Hawke very early on. And when I was asked a question and posed a lot of different things, I can't tell you about that, but what I can tell you is, <laughs> <laughs> the, the fact is that the relationship between stronger elements of Christianity, because we should not assume that Christianity at all levels is on the skits. In fact, you know, I think you know, the participation of younger people in some cases is, is actually more upwards than, than downwards. So how these things are to be reconciled, all I can say is that in the world as we live at the moment, we in Australia are particularly well located to be able to, for, for the moment, to have some control over what happens within our own country and so on. Now, this is far less true in places like Europe and so on. And I probably, the, the real answer I can give you is the one I give when someone says to me, how are we going to sort out the situation about the, the, the government of Israel and the Palestinians? And my answer to that is, it was insoluble when I was born, it will be insoluble when I die, and it may well be always insoluble, when the same people want the same land. And that in itself, and this leads, of course, to the question of the indigenous people in Australia. So that, that is a fundamental question. And which way it's going to go, it's very hard to tell at this day. At the moment, the signs are, you know, uh, disastrous, but it may be that economic development in particular countries, I mean a country like Afghanistan is now playing cricket and, and, and actually winning the matches of the World Cup, it may be that over time that these things moderate and that, that Islamic people don't necessarily all have to be extreme Islamic people any more than Christians are all extreme Christian people. And could I make one other part of it, which is a great way of avoiding what you asked. And the, the comments in, in Great Britain, there was an argument about how much churchgoers were empathetic to social reform and looking after the people, poor and needy. And the broad finding was that the people who went to church were less likely to be concerned with, with the poor and needy than the rest. But the really dedicated people who went to, church, went to church were far more likely. In other words, in the masses of people who, who turned up at church, as one, way, as one of my friends used to say, it's always good to have an early service because we get it out of the way for the rest of the day. <laughs> the genuine um, 
yeah. strongly minded Christians were actually very prominent in, in social reform. So there were always reservations and complications about things, but we can only hope that worldwide interaction may, in due course, I mean, the fact that the Americans and the Iranians are actually talking to each other, and the Cubans and the Americans are, may be that this may have right its way out, but you may well be right, it, it may well, you know, be something I won't know about, but the only things I won't know about. <laughs> Why should at least half the brains of the community, at least half the brains, be deprived of absolute equal opportunities for everything and everything, even allowing that the problem of, 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 you know, of the fact that they're the ones who have the children, and then the fact is that they, you know. Um, I, I think that, that that's a significant factor, and if you look at Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland, of the first, if you list the countries by the percentage of women in the national parliament, all four of those countries are in the first 25. Mm -hmm. All four of them. In other words, they are high taxing, relatively, strong social welfare, strong education programs. Professor Carmen Lawrence, who's you know, known for you for a number of other reasons, mm -hmm. tells me that the most, the best access for education across the entire population in the world is in Finland, mm -hmm. without the exception, and most of the rest is in the Scandinavian countries. So, the, you know, the, 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 it is possible to collect rather more money than we do. And I think one of the problems in Australia is that we don't collect it in the near as much as we should. And the, I'm not that I want to pay them more. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think the, the, the fact that, that it's going to need more revenue, it just is going to need it because you cannot have an increasingly substantial portion of the population who are not in the workforce, and that's rising steadily. Percentage you are not in the workforce. And you also need to get your issues sorted out. As for the case with using superannuation so that people can afford to buy a house when they're young, you know, have access to super now. It's all very well, but the trouble is that that, that, that only adds to the other problem at the other end. So I, I haven't given the impression of raising a whole series of insoluble problems. <laughs> but the fact is, and look, it's, it's put clear to me what I've seen. My uncle, one of my uncles died. He died of tuberculosis. One of my aunts died of diphtheria. Yeah. People don't die of tuberculosis and diphtheria now. In fact, the, those kind of diseases the medical sciences have dealt with. What the medical sciences can't cure are heart conditions, but they can help. They can't cure cancer, they can still be on, and they, at the moment, can't, certainly can't deal with dementia. All of these three are longer term problems which cannot be fixed by easy medical means. So the fact is that the population is progressively going to age and at the same time it's going to have progressively more people who are a longer period of time have to be looked after. And I think it's probably fair to say that the only way it can really be dealt with in the end is that the existing young community has to contribute more. And that in turn I think where means testing I think is, is, is a factor. The fact that at the moment that, that you can get an age pension and that you can have over a million dollars in the bank plus a house that's worth whatever you like, it does seem to me that sooner or later that's going to be tackled. Mm -hmm. <laughs>